starting to pass the path to college where we're going to be discussing uh, the superstring. Okay. Um, now, as motivation for this part of the class, um, let me remind you that uh, how we got the equation of motion in this. You see, we had a bosonic string, and on that bosonic string we imposed the condition that t and high rate states of the zero mode of that gave us an equation of motion t squared is equal to x squared, where m was related to the top. Okay? Now, what we want to do is to get some generalization of this, this string. Um, moving around, that will allow, and notice of course that one of the features of the bosonic string is that all the particles in space time go both ends. We want to describe a universe in which, which also has functions. In particular, maybe also has supersymmetry. Uh, so you might ask what we have to do for that. But clearly, in addition to an equation like this, we need an equation like p slash is equal to m. We need a Dirac equation. Something like this. Okay? Um, and we need to get that. Um, we need to get that by uh, um, we need to get that by uh, by imposing some, if we're going to follow the same procedure that we did for the bosonic string, we need to get that by imposing some sort of constraint algebra, uh, perhaps whose zero mode gives you the same, this kind of equation. Okay. Now, the funny thing about this p slash is that unlike here, this has matrix indices. Okay. Uh, now, all of space time arose out of quantization of the string. Right, I mean, uh, the, the, the Klein-Gordon equation was an equation that came from quantizing the string. So these indices also have to come from quantizing the string. So the question that, that you could ask is, what kind of structure on the well volume of the string upon quantization would give you equations like this with these kind of indices? Now, the indices come from implementing the following algebra. Gamma mu, gamma mu is equal to theta mu. Okay? So if you had some sort of quantization of the string, such that that quantization of the string led to operators that obeyed this algebra, you would naturally get these matrix structures on which uh, wave functions would act. Okay, and you can ask what kind of uh, um, what kind of quantization would give that? And the answer to this question, of course, is uh, fermionic quantum mechanics. Okay, so suppose you had the following: suppose you had a structure that looked like this, psi zero mu, psi zero. Mu. Okay, let's come to the zero for now. We got. Suppose we have this kind of quantum mechanics where psi was now an anti commuting. Okay, suppose I have quantum mechanics that do this. Okay, now there are many things about this quantum mechanics that sound strange. Firstly, if I looked at the corresponding quantum mechanics where psi was a bosonic field, that is, I looked at x mu, x mu dot, uh, what can you say about this quantum mechanics? This is trivial. It's trivial because this is same as half of uh, d by dt x mu x mu. So the the Grangian was a total derivative. But let's just see the algebra that gave this to us. Probably this was really half. Just let me check that this is equal to this. This is half of x mu dot x mu plus x mu x mu dot. This is just true. However, to make this equal to this, you crucially use the fact that x mu dot and x mu commute to each other. Notice on the other hand that if you had x mu dot and x mu that were not commuting with each other, okay, then this would not be equal to a total length. Okay? So firstly, this Lagrangian makes sense in the sense it's non trivial when sin mu dot uh, sin mu are anti commuting Okay? Great. So, uh, now that we've got that, we've got that out of the way, what would the, uh, what 
about the physics of such a Lagrangian field. Uh, we're going to, in one of the, in the subsequent lectures, review quantization of, you know, path integral quantizations of fermions um, in great detail. But for now, I just do it roughly. Okay? Uh, till we get to that point, I'll just do it roughly. Roughly speaking, this is the canonical object of that. Okay? So, what we have is that psi mu, and you know that when you work with fermions, instead of using commutators, you have to use anti commutators. All these are profoundly unsatisfying statements, by the way, until you see it work up, worked out. It's nice to see how it works from a path integral. But, I will show you soon in a couple of lectures. For now, this is motivational path. Take it for granted that this kind of path integral implements this algebra. So this is you know, delta function, okay? And with appropriate normalization, you put a two there. Okay, so that's great. We see that this Dirac matrix algebra can be thought of as emerging out of the quantization of a rather natural quantum mechanics. A very simple quantum mechanics whose Lagrangian contains anti-commuting fields. So as to all that time, it's very simple. Is this clear? Notice that this is the analog of the statement that this Lagrangian that uh, the quantization of the free, the free bosonic particle, okay, gave you Klein quantum equation. Here I'm only getting uh, the matrices. You'll have to somehow couple that with Klein quantum part to try to get a Dirac, to try to get a Dirac equation. But you see that if you have roughly what we did for the bosons, plus some fermions, some fermionic quantum mechanics thrown in, there's a chance we will get Dirac type equations. Okay. Now, our whole, the whole point of our discussion over the last semester, well, the last that we've been discussing, was that our fields were not point particle type, they lived on strings. So we want some action on the word volume of the string whose zero mode could reduce to this sin mu sin mu number. Okay? And well, what could that be? There's an obvious category. It's just the Dirac action. Ah, I'm including this. Which will be the st a statement that different polarizations of a spinner have the same energy. You have more representations. Right? You have e to the power i p, e to the power omega t, and then many possible polarizations, all with the same energy. Because, okay, that of course is more related to the space time Hamiltonian. Okay, but you know there's a tight connection between space time and world sheet Hamiltonian because you get the equation of motion for space time by sharing a world sheet Hamiltonian. Okay. Huh. Okay. Great. So uh, the obvious thing to try is to take the action that we had on the world volume of the string, the bosonic string. So what we've been doing last semester was to say we have the action one by four pi alpha prime. Um, Square root G, G alpha, eta, uh, del alpha, x mu, del, eta, mu. Okay? I understood that that action is not to be. Yeah. The claim is that if you take this action and quantize it, this is the quantization. The quantization is a Hilbert space formed from operators that obey this algebra. But you know the answer to that in that space is? What is the answer? The answer is gamma matrices. Gamma matrices in D dimensions. Because gamma matrices in D dimensions are very simple. So what is quantization? It is producing the Hilbert space. It's a process producing the Hilbert space whose operator spectrum includes operators that, that implement your algebra. This is of course a trivial thing. But producing the smallest Hilbert space that that's that's Okay, so if you have this quantum mechanics, you want to find um, you want to find an operator algebra that would implement the canonical.
to computation of this. It's got to be matrix. The simplest algebra is just the algebra of the arc matrices. So if you have this thing, you would produce your, your Hilbert space would include indices in addition to the wave functions in space, which come from the bosonic part. And that's roughly what you need for the Dirac equation. Because wave functions have to be labeled by motion in space as well as polarization indices. Okay? So this is the kind of structure that we want. That we see that we're getting it by putting fermions, uh, by, by, by having fermions on the world, on the on the world sheet. That's really important. This the point was that fermions on the world sheet somehow can end up producing fermions in space-time. As we just said. More precisely, anti-commuting fields in the world sheet can end up producing uh, fermions in space-time. But now I want to do full string theory. Okay? So I want to do string, full string theory. So what I'm going to do is try and make a proposal and see if it starts working. Okay, and the proposal I'm going to make is that I'm going to have to augment this action that I wrote here with the Dirac action on the world, on the world sheet of the string. Okay? Uh, I'm going to start by working in conformal gate. Okay? okay? I'm just going to start by working in conformal gate and we will come back later on to try to see how all the deep issues of gauge fixing and physical state condition and all of that. For now, I just... Okay? So let's take this action and simplify it. This is just... Theta is theta. Okay? And I will... Just in this section, theta, I'll write down the Dirac action. So the Dirac action is uh, psi bar and slash. Okay? Right. Okay. So X mu has had an interpretation in terms of the space time. Right now, psi does not have a space time interpretation. X mu has had an interpretation in terms of the space time. Right. Right now, psi will not have a, a, a spatial interpretation. As we can see, the zero modes of psi will produce indices of wave functions. So they'll be interpreted they, in terms of some sort of spin. Okay? And then the other fields of psi, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, right. At the moment, no interpretation. We're just generalizing that structure in some abstract way. We will see how this gives us what we want. So I try to motivate why you might want to do this. Uh, is this clear? Questions or comments about the motivation? So this is like completely analogous to what happens in the bosonic case, right? Even there's a zero mode, looks like a particle, but the non-zero mode has no particle interpretation. So. Uh, but I think Ashish's question was that in the uh, in the zero mode, even in the non-zero modes, you have this interpretation as a physical string moving around in space time. Okay. Okay? And I think what he wanted to know was what are these sides doing as they move around in space? Okay? The best way to answer that question is actually by looking at the equivalence of what we're going to be doing with what's called the Grinch Wall string. It's a long path to that, and we'll come to it. Okay? But I'll tell you the words. Um, there is a way of reformulating what we are doing. We, we, what we're doing is the NSR picture of the string, the Nebuchadnezzar your one picture of the string, which is for many purposes most convenient for calculations. Okay? There is another picture, another another mathematically equivalent way of formulating the dynamics of the string uh, called the Green-Schwartz picture. Okay? And in the Green-Schwartz picture, what you see is you don't have the fermionic fields on the world sheet, but you've got a bosonic string, but whose target space is motion in a space-time, which has, apart from bosonic directions, some fermionic directions. So then you have a string moving in superspace on the, uh, in space time, and that, that is nearer to what Ashish wants, I think. It's a bit harder to interpret these, these sides, but you'll have to, you'll have to be patient. Okay, um, yes, good, thank you. Uh, but we have not introduced any world sheet to fermionic direction. Now we have. Uh, world sheet, at least we have introduced world sheet anti-commuting directions, and in fact the fermionic, because we've got to put a Dirac equation on the world sheet. Okay? Uh, uh, please go on. Maybe I didn't understand. No, uh, I, uh, in a sense, like... Uh, oh, we don't have world sheet super switch. Is that what yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that, that will soon come. We will see that uh, the boson and the fermion will be packaged together. The, the, the action will soon turn out to be super symmetrical. And that will soon 
But that's right. We soon will do that. Okay? But it's not at all obvious that that maneuver gives you space time suicide. And it's not always true. You hang on a, a bit. You know, these things are related, but not they're not joined at the hip. They're more like shaking hands. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so this is the action that I'm going to be studying. Okay, so now let's take a little while just to look at the free Dirac equation, the free Dirac action in two dimensions. Okay, let's start first by dealing with the uh, Lorentz effect. So, uh, we're in two dimensions and uh, um, uh, we, we, we need to make a choice of gamma matrices. Okay? So, we can make a choice of gamma matrices in two dimensions that's completely different. And that's convenient for many, many purposes. Okay? So, let me remind you that there are, we're dealing with two plus two spinners. So, there are three potential gamma matrices. There's sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. These are all conditioned. If I was working in Lorentzian space, I want a, I would want a gamma one which was a mission, and a gamma in zero that was an empty mission. Okay. So this is a good choice for gamma zero, that is empty mission, because I sigma two is real. Okay. So I'm going to choose this to be my gamma zero. Just a choice of basis. Nothing depends on it. That's convenient. And then I have to choose something to be gamma one. Let's try. We'll try each of these to see which which makes it look nice. Let's first try. This. Let's call this gamma. Okay. Now, since I'm able to choose my gamma matrices to be real, okay, I am consistently able to choose the spinners also to be real. Okay. So my spinners will also be taken to be real. It would make make no make, make no sense if the Dirac equation was complex. Since it's real, it makes sense. You know all this, right? Okay. Two dimensions, you can do it. Okay. So the the Dirac Lagrangian is what? It's psi times It's real times gamma zero uh, transpose. Okay, times psi bar del slash. So gamma one del one plus gamma zero del zero sub. So this is my uh, my Dirac Okay, so I've made my choices. So let's stick with them. So now what we have, we've got this times. Um, Minus I, uh, wait. Actually, no transpose. Uh, so we we'll do psi diagonal and gamma, gamma diagonal. No, it doesn't matter because I have a minus sign which will fix my. I mean, the usual thing would be no Okay, so now let's just write down these matrices. So I read this all very explicitly just because it's nice to see what people wrote. Yeah, it's nice to see how. <coughs> the standard Lagrangian boils down to what you see in textbooks. Okay, so uh, uh, let's write these matrices down very explicitly. So sigma one is, is sigma one is equal to zero one one zero. Uh, uh, sigma two now which was it minus i or plus i? Minus i. Okay, so let's take i sigma two, which is uh, i sigma two is equal to zero one minus one zero. And uh, uh, sigma three of course is one minus one zero. Okay. So now we're going to work this out. So this thing is psi transpose times gamma zero, which which was i sigma two. Then our gamma one, which was sigma three, l one plus gamma zero. Uh, which is I sigma 2, del 0 on psi. Okay, now let's just multiply. Okay, so sigma 2 <coughs> times 
sigma 3 is i sigma 1. Okay, uh, the i cancels with the sigma t times minus sigma 1, delta 1. <coughs> And uh, i sigma 2 times i sigma 2 uh, is minus 1. So minus del 0 psi. completely clear.
genetically continue to Euclidean space, like we did so often for the bosonic string. Okay? Um, this is an aside for now because we stick to the Lorentz in space for the next 10 minutes. But if we took the Lagrangian and analytically continue to Euclidean space, okay, as uh, you're familiar with, you know, x0 goes to i, x picks up factor of i, so these plus and minus become z and z now. Okay, so if it is uh, psi plus is often written as psi, psi minus is often written as psi bar, or psi tilde or something. It's not to be confused with complex conjugation. Okay, in Lorentzian space, psi and psi tilde, psi plus and psi minus, totally independent real fields. Okay? And then the equation of the uh, uh, the, uh, the Lagrangian becomes integral psi del del bar psi plus psi tilde del I think it's all about psi. It's confusing the It's all about psi. Okay? Which tells you that psi is an entirely analytic field. Whereas psi bar is an entirely analytic field. Okay. Notice how beautifully you get, uh, uh, how beautifully this, you remember that when we looked at a free boson in two dimensions, the, well, this is Lagrangian. The phase space split up apart from zero dimensions. Okay, into completely analytic, a sum of completely analytic and completely non-analytic. Something very similar happens with the, uh, with the Dirac field in a slightly different way. It's not like the same field is a sum of analytic and anti The Dirac thing has two components. One part is purely analytic, the other part is purely anti -analytic. Okay? Great. Now, um, we're going to just proceed to understand the quantization of this, this, uh, this Dirac field on the world sheet of the spring in a little more detail before we, before we start doing more sophisticated things. Okay? Basically, delta psi plus wedge delta psi del sigma uh, Now, uh, 
We used this notation maybe in our discussion of the bosonic string a year ago. Do people remember it? Have you? Okay. I'm seeing lots of people nodding. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll just remind you. See, what we've got here is a first order, a, a Lagrangian uh, that has no more than more, no more than first order terms in time. Okay. Now, if you're you're doing a path integral with a Lagrangian that has only first order terms in time, you might want to remember. In what context, what familiar context you ever done like path integrals with Lagrangians uh, with only first order terms in time? Okay? And the familiar context is when you do a Hamiltonian path integral, phase space path integral. We're very used to in the classical mechanics doing a path integral which goes like e to the power i integral L. But you know that this is the same as the path integral which is e to the power i uh, p q dot minus h. But this path integral now is not just a path integral over Q's, but over Q's and the P's. And we know that these, this is generated from quantum mechanics, which means that it leads to the commutation relation that is appropriate for Q and P. Namely, P, Q is equal to 1. So what was the general rule? The general rule was that the commutator of the thing which is dotted with its coefficient is equal to 1. Okay? And uh, that rule is kept track of here. This is the two form. It may be two. Anyway, one, one way of doing it is to plug into this symplectic form and find the symplectic forms and alphas. Okay? Plug into the symplectic form, find the symplectic forms on alphas. And then from that, break up the commutation relation. Okay? So, uh, let me, um, let me uh, roughly do this. And if you, if you find that uh, the notation is uh, unfamiliar to you, I'll ask you to review your old notes or to do it in the most straightforward way. The most straightforward way would be, you know, the way that Jorkin and Breyer would do it, or, you know, yeah, yeah. Peskin and Schroeder would do it, but it's most straightforward. You put this in, you treat these as operators, you find the canonical commutation relations, blah, blah, blah. however you want, you can do it. Okay? But I'll quickly do it this way just so that we get the factors away. Okay, so this uh, symplectic form will go how? Um, this thing here, you see, because we've got this integral, it only clicks when we've got n and minus n. So this becomes delta alpha n. And then there is a factor of n because this derivative will put out an n. There's some i's which are not in the track of. Uh, and then this will be wedge delta alpha minus n. Okay. Uh, so we would have delta alpha n, delta alpha minus n, and then uh, this would then lead to the commutation relation up to signs. Uh, I know what the right signs are. <laughs> it would be alpha n, alpha n is like creation, alpha minus n, uh, is equal to 1 by n for positive. Okay, now presumably Kuczynski won't want this 1 by n, so presumably he put a 1 by no, root, root n. Let me just check.
I messed up with this. You see? You see? You see, the delta comes from just the time directed part. I'm sorry about that. You see, this thing here had a time derivative. I'm sorry. I confused you and then I did it wrong, which is inexcusable. But let me, let me say, let me. This, see, let me, let me just go back. What was, we had psi plus del zero, what was it? Del. Del zero plus del, del zero minus del one psi plus. Okay. Now, canonical commutation relations only come from the kinetic term. The del one here was irrelevant. That's potential. So as long, uh, for the canonical structure, this is just psi plus del zero psi plus. So the canonical conjugate is this, not a del sigma. Okay. But that wouldn't matter. What? It matters because then this del sigma would be what was given the aim. But sigma plus tau. What? It's sigma plus tau in the argument. Doesn't matter. There is no del. No del. No del. Uh -huh. no del. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, so we get, uh, well, this is the symplectic form, and this is the canonical commutation. This is the canonical commutation relations. But I'm saying something very simple, I mean something that you, you know from your best game student. So that's like some 2 pi sitting around which is, I want to like, it should be 1 over 2 pi on the right side, which is... Okay, you want the 2 pi, so I mean that's... <laughs> no, what are you supposed to do, like, what? that seems to be the, what is the rule here, basically? Really? Okay, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you. So, really, we have first talked about the, the rule is that whatever the factor is here in the Poisson bracket, we can put it. Right. Okay. So if we really have 2 pi here, we get 1 over 2 pi. Yeah. But my Lagrange chain was, I would imagine, was 1 over 2 pi psi by L slash psi. No alpha prime? No alpha prime. No alpha prime because a psi doesn't have, is not a limit. Uh, but uh, let me. Um, so we can uh, let me let me let me just check with the Pujitsky formalizations. Let me have a fine. Okay, so Pujitsky has one over. Ah, so this is one over. Yeah, this is one over two pi. So this this is coming out. So this would really have uh, uh, nothing, and then that would really have nothing. Okay, but I leave you to do this kind of stuff carefully. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, excellent. So we've completed our quantization. Is that last part when we put that the commutator anti commutator this because we know all that we're quantizing from this. Okay. The last part that we put anti commutator, it's because what we're really going to be doing is a path integral with these signs. And you have to ask the question what trace over a Hilbert space generates this path? Okay? And the Hilbert space that generates this path integral is one with anti commutative fields. Okay? This is the thing I tried to I promised you that we will carefully go through derivation of fermionic path integrals. What kind of Hilbert space? See, the question you ask in quantum mechanics is in quantum mechanics. Given a Hilbert space, you want to find an evolution operator of a trace. Okay? You can take the Hilbert space and turn it into an integral over a path integral. We're very familiar with doing that over Boson. We do it for bosonic quantum mechanics and then bosonic quantum field theory is just doing that many times. Okay? But you could ask, no, that's great. But suddenly when we're doing path integral, suddenly we sometimes declare this guy is anti commutative The interesting question, you, know, you can declare what you want. But the interesting question is, what kind of, what kind of Hilbert space uh, evolution operators or traces can be rewritten as such? Anti-commuting path integrals. Okay? And the answer to that basically is the spin off system. Or many copies of the spin off system. And that's what this did not feel is. Okay? So just like in, in when, when you study Feynman and Higgs, you go through the exercise for how a single particle, <clears throat> in quantum mechanics, a single particle can be written as bosonic path integral, and then quantum field is just many copies of that. There is a similar canonical exercise to do for uh, part integrals of the spin half system. Okay? You can take the spin half system, simple spin half system, spin up, spin down, write on an, an arbitrary evolution operator and show that you can now rewrite that evolution operator in terms of part integrals over uh, anti commuting fields. Okay? Then quantum field takes many copies of that. Now, if you go and look at that, those rules, you see that this structure with anti commuting fields with a psi psi dot is a structure
structure that is associated with anti commuting operator in the spin-off system. Okay? Just like in quantum water economy mechanics, you see that Px dot is the structure associated with. Okay? So it's that exercise that I have to take you through. I wasn't planning to do it in this lecture. I was planning to do it more systematically when we need it more systematically. Okay? But that's the thing. The, the, your question was just one of general quantum field. Then what is the inverse phase on interpretation of anti-computing path taker? And there's a general answer to this. Okay. Um, the place where it's very nicely reviewed is the, as an appendix in one of the two volumes of Richard's I can't remember which one. First one. It's very nicely reviewed there, and we go through this in class. Because we need it. We need to get it to be straight. Okay? But this is just some canonical thing in quantum. It's the same thing. Okay, excellent. Other questions or comments? Excellent. So now what we have is uh, um, now what we have is this uh, uh, this nice structure. These things have become operators, um, and uh, great. So at first sight, it seems like our the spectrum of this theory is okay. At first sight, it seems like we've got a bunch of fermionic harmonic oscillators. Okay. Clearly, the energy of the nth harmonic oscillator is a
Three also you get away with two. But four needs two squared. Five you get away with two squared, but six needs two cube and so on. So not the next. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> two. Between friends, two to the party. So they can't both, they can't all 
all be numbers. Okay? So this thing is most, uh, when, when you just have one, it's a slightly singular system. Okay? Uh, and when, yeah, let, let me, let, the, the, the problem, let me, you see, there's actually, there's something more to say, let me, let me just, okay. uh, Probably something more to say, but I think what I said was just right. That if you just had one, you could get away by just saying there's no further in that space. And this was just a number. But when you have many, you, you say that that's not true. It's like asking, is there a consistent Dirac algebra in one dimension? And you could get away with one dimension because it's just a statement that something squares to one. Which is a very uh, I know that the condensed matter people make a big they don't like it when they get an odd number of Majorana zeros. Uh, I know that it bothers them. <laughs> There's something more to say about it. Okay, I don't know what it is. Okay. I think you've hit upon a very deep question which no doubt will win a Nobel Prize one day. But at the moment we will just use the fact that we have made. In fact, well, it's not so much a difference between one and two. It's a, Odd and even people somehow distinguish quite a bit. Um, but let me just move on. I'm not sure. Certainly, if we have many, especially, yeah, certainly if we have many. I think I, I'll go with that at the moment. The statement that if you have one, there's no further Hilbert space, it's just a number. And if you have many, we need a further Hilbert space. And uh, uh, this will uh, also go with Shubhajit Z to the power formula. Because box d by 2 will be 0 when d is equal to 1. Okay, yeah. So, so basically, it looks quite trivial when, it, when d is 1, but when you've got many, because they have to anticommute with each other, it's not just a tiny You get the data. Okay, good. Uh, other questions or comments? Excellent, good question. Okay, uh, so let's move on. So, this Hilbert space looks very nice. Okay. Uh, However, it's not the only Hilbert space we can associate with this system. This Hilbert space, by the way, is called the Hilbert space of the free for Fermi on in what is called the Ramon sector. The Ramon sector is the sector in which fermions around the circle are periodic. Okay. But oftentimes it happens in the theory of fermions that every observable is a bilinear observable. Energy density would be five linear fermions, number density. And this will turn out to be the case in some appropriate sense in what we do. If that's the case, then when you've got fermions on the circle, it's not necessary for them to be periodic on the circle. Because they can come back to themselves up to a phase that squares to one. Now, a phase that squares to one has another name, it's called minus one. <laughs> okay. So these fermions can come back to themselves up to a minus sign. Okay? So let's look at how the quantization would go if it were indeed allowed for the fermions to come back to themselves as you go around the circle up to a minus sign. Okay? This is what's called the Nego Schwartz sector of the fermions. Okay? Then what would happen? Well, it's totally true. Well, we have the same expansion. Except that n's instead of being integers will be integers plus half. Okay, we have the same commutation relations here and same anti-commutation relations. 
but we just lack a zero mode. So all the fun, the new interesting stuff is associated with the zero mode that was there in the Ramon sector, the periodic sector, is not there in this Nebuchadnezzar sector, this anti-periodic sector. Okay? What is the spectrum in the Nebuchadnezzar sector? It's more boring. Just a bunch of harmonic oscillators of energy, half, three halves, five halves, and so on. That into infinity. I uh, mean, into D. Is this clear? Okay, correct. So, we understand now, if we take this free Fermi on, we understand what the system is. It's a bunch of fermionic harmonic, harmonic, harmonic oscillators in the Nebuchadnezzar schwartz sector. In the Ramon sector, it's also a bunch of fermionic harmonic oscillators. Plus, there's this interesting style from the zero quantization of the zero. So, can the same thing be what you have a remote sector in the Nebuchadnezzar sector? Can the same theory? Like ah, so what we are going to do, as you will see, is that we will allow a sum of both these sectors with a particular projection. So you are saying psi will be integer sum plus half integer sum. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Hang on. And since psi plus and psi minus are completely independent, are there two zero modes? Or Excellent question. Yes. Since psi plus and psi minus are completely independent, um, uh, since psi plus and psi minus are completely independent, um, you might naively think there are two zero modes, but of course the zero mode is just the zero mode. You see, because you can, there's only one mode that doesn't depend on, see, the, the psi plus and psi minus, no, 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 but I said, let me, let me say, sorry, you're right, you're right, you're right. Psi plus and psi minus are completely independent, and there are two zero modes, because there's one zero mode in the upper column, and one zero mode in the lower column. So this is unlike the boson experiment, unlike the boson. See, x here was written as x plus of sigma plus plus x minus of sigma minus. And then a constant could belong to either here or here and would be overcounted to five counted twice. Okay? But now in our case we really must count it twice. Okay? We really must count it twice because, uh, because there's psi plus and there's psi minus and they're totally different. So a constant piece here and a constant piece here just totally different. So there are two zero modes. And we can implement either Nebuchadnezzar or Ramon sector sir. independently. We can implement either Nebuchadnezzar or Ramon sector independently in plus and minus. And uh, we will spend a lot of time discussing what we have to do to get a consistent string. Yeah, we can, you said you can also implement the same on both the boundary condition each sector, I mean, each high plus, suppose. Totally independent. No, you might say. Psi plus is a sum of integers also and sum of half integers also. Yes, we will allow. There is no periodicity here. Psi bar psi is periodic. Okay? So, we are going to allow psi to be any field such that psi bar psi is periodic. One possibility is that psi is periodic. Another possibility is that psi is anti periodic. All are allowed at the moment. Okay, we're going to see that it will be clearly an inconsistent theory to allow all in an unrestricted way. But hang on, at the moment, everything's allowed. Okay, you could have half integers or integers. Let me say it again. If our boundary conditions are only that psi bar psi is periodic around the circle, then right at the beginning, I should have written such an expansion where n is where n runs over integers or half integers. Is this clear? Another way of saying it is that psi being anti periodic, suppose psi goes to itself after a phase, after a winding once around the circle. That's exactly the same thing as psi going up to itself without a phase, after winding around, twice around the circle. So it's exactly like a periodic expansion of psi on a circuit of length 4 pi. Okay? Which would allow n to be arbitrary. Half integers or integers. Okay? We are just implementing that boundary condition have all of these together. It's no, it's no different from saying you could have had one and two. You could also have the one, three halves and two. It's nothing mysterious. It's not some deep puzzle here. I'm not orienting the string when you put it in the Unorienting the string when well, you You mean this doubling? Yeah, this doubling will be sort of removing this spin structure. You know, the possibility.
possibilities of uh, the there's this thing in mathematics called spin structure, which is basically this, this following thing. When you go around an non-trivial cycle, is, does the fermion go around itself? The plus sign or minus sign. I'm saying that if you've got on a circle, a, a non-trivial spin structure, which is the minus sign, can be removed by doubling the circle. Just because minus one squares two. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, but simple stuff so far. Okay? Any further questions or comments? So there should be no level matching. There should be no level matching. Sorry, quick. No, there will be level matching, uh -huh. but that will involve projections. Hang on. Okay. Hang on. Yes. We first, so far we've just done well, you know, free world shift in two dimensions. Now we're going to slowly get it up to the street. Hang on. Okay? Great. But these are all excellent questions. I will address them. Okay. So now, what I want to do is to put together this bosonic string action that we had and this fermionic action. Okay. I'm now going to move to Euclidean space. Okay. So we had 1 by 4 pi alpha prime. Uh, Plus 1 by 2 pi plus 1 by 2 pi uh, psi bar del psi bar del psi plus psi del bar psi. Okay? So now imagine we have a string with both these fields together. Okay, so we've got the bosons and the formula. That's clearly what you want to do if you want to the Dirac type equation. Because the zero mode motion, the wave function will come from here. Yeah? Whereas the indices will come from here. Okay? So now I'm going to look at this combined system. I'm going to look at the combined system and show you that it has, um, that this system actually has a larger symmetry average than that of Vera solar generators alone. Namely, it implements what is called a super Vera solar energy. Okay? So, that this system will be our first introduction to a super conformal Okay? And the super conformal invariants will play the same role in the super string as conformal invariants played for the result. By which I mean, uh, we will demand that the generators are superconformal invariants and high rate physical states. Just like we demanded that the generators of conformal invariants and high rate physical states in the bosonic stream. Okay? You'll see what I mean as we go along. Okay. So, this, the, the, the superconformal invariants in the system is going to be extremely important. But, uh, okay. So, uh, in order to gear off to that, let me first uh, 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 let me first be you know, careful. Now I am going to use Polchinsky's convention, and Polchinsky's conventions, very okay, fortunately or not, have lots of tools in what he means by del and del bar. So that we have to look at. Um, So, let me see, uh, let me see, okay, so I now want to do everything correctly including factors of 2. Um, so far we had done everything correctly up to factors of 2. I think it actually 
connection. Give me a minute. Let's get these factors of two straight. It's, it might be because of this n and minus n. It's like a two cross two matrix. Uh, just, just. Uh, It's this, sorry. It, so suppose I start with this, now let me work on the symplectic form. Okay, so this is 1 by 4 pi del sigma wedge del sigma. Okay, so now let us put in the expansion of del sigma. So sigma, sorry, del psi. Psi was equal to alpha n e to the power i n uh, sigma plus tau, let's say. Okay, so as we said before, we have to have these guys with negative, with n's negative of each other. But we could have either n and minus n, or minus n and n. So you get an extra factor of 2. Okay, yeah. So this 1 over 4 pi is what actually would have given us the symplectic form we wanted. Okay, and uh, uh, it gives us this. Okay, so that, that, that's basically it. That's basically uh, this was consistent. Okay, so this, now I'm going to try to be serious. Um, I'm going to be, try to be serious and get everything right with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with numbers. Um, this here is same thing as 1 over 2 pi alpha prime. Now this is this. Oh my. Kuczynski writes as d to z, and that sometimes has a factor of 2 in it, right? Oh my god. Just, uh, just let me just Okay. So firstly, I'm going to withdraw a couple things. What I said now was wrong. Okay. So it's true that I get 1 over 1. Suppose I start with the one. Suppose I started with the one over four. Okay, it's actually one by two pi d two x. I think just one, just one. D two z. Yeah. Z, Pul Pulchinsky z, like everyone z, is x plus I, x one plus i x two. So his d two z is two times. These are because there are two ways of getting it. Okay, uh, so that was the point. Now, why, did, why, why, why was my convincing argument about this factor of two wrong? Yeah, it, was, it was wrong because you should think of the symplectic form as matrix. Okay, so this thing will give us the symplectic form del alpha n, where right, del alpha uh, minus n times two, as we said. But this is the matrix one minus one. Okay? And so then when we invert it, invert this matrix, with this factor of 2, it becomes the matrix 1 minus 1. And the matrix elements are the Poisson matrix. Do you understand? Okay? So sorry, I, I got it right, then I got it wrong, then I got it right. I hope. Let's see if there's another one. <laughs> Is this clear? Is it clear, Arunabha? I'm not sure. Okay, so <laughs> Let me say it once again. I, I, we, we do get this, this thing. But this, of course, can be written as uh, delta alpha n, which delta alpha minus n, minus delta alpha minus n, which delta alpha n. Okay. So then if you write this as a matrix, 
This is this anti-symmetric matrix with the 1 and minus n. Okay? So now when you invert it, you go back to this 1 and minus 1. The, and the inverse of the symplectic form are the coefficients in the Poisson bracket. That gives you that one. Why are you getting an anti-symmetric matrix? Why are we 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 getting an anti-sym
bridge and the uh, and the end. Okay. Okay. Exactly right. Okay. Uh, excellent questions. Let's keep going. Um, so, yeah. So this was the correct, uh, the correct, uh, uh, the correct algebra with the d two x, which we're not going to write as d in some funny dz notation. Okay. So now. The next thing we're going to do is to compute the OPs of sides. And we're going to use the same method that we used. Uh, we're going to use the same method that we used uh, while discussing uh, uh, the Gozani theory. So we can be fast because we remember the method. Right. So the method is this we've got a pass and take on it. I'm just going to do side class and side minus OP. Similar. e to the power 1 by 2 pi d2x. Uh, Side then side. That's our path. Okay. And then we're going to use the Schwinger Dyson equation. Okay? We're going to use the Schwinger Dyson equation in the following way. We say, let us look at integral d psi, d by d psi of psi of x. e to the, sorry, to the minus sign, minus 1 by 2 pi, e to x, psi, tens, plus, plus, plus. The Schwinger Dyson equation is simply the statement that that thing is 0 because it is uh, an integral of a total element. Okay, but now again, I can break this up. So let's say this is at some point. Okay, the first thing is d psi delta of x minus y. Uh, e to the power minus 1 by 2 pi, blah blah, all this stuff. And then the second thing is integral d psi and now we get a minus sign because we take a d by d psi through a sign. X. These are always varying with the right? Psi of x, okay, times minus 1 by 2 pi times factor of 2 because we vary either this or this times, let's say I vary this, del slash psi of Why? In that case, we pick up another minus sign because. Going oh no, you are varying the first one. I vary the first one, and then when I vary the second, I'll end up getting the same thing. But should we psi of x do what psi of x? Psi of x, yes. Oh, you put the psi of the minus. <laughs> this is. Uh, minus was just this one by two pi. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we get. Uh, so what? Are, what do we? What do we conclude? You see, this path integral brought down here uh, just normalizes this correlation function. Okay, so this equation, see if you believe me, is the equation that del slash or del bar, del bar y of psi of x. Psi of y uh, now we had 1 by pi is equal to minus delta of x minus y was 2 by 2 2 by 2 by 2 okay I've got my minus signs right right Excellent. Okay. Now we ask then, what does this tell us about the two-point function? What does this tell us about the two-point function of uh, 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 of psi of x? Psi of x. 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 Psi of x.
higher back style. Hmm? Should be a step one. Mm. Something like that. Let's remember. Let's remember. Oh, sorry, this one. This guy is completely analytic. Apart from as an x equals y. In fact, that's the first thing we should have said. Had there been no insertion, suppose I had done the same manipulation with no insertion, I would have got the one point function of del slash y is equal to 0. Del, del plus i is equal to 0. So y, psi, away from insertion, is completely analytic. Okay? That's what this statement, this thing is also saying that this guy is totally analytic away from the insertion. Okay? So all functions, if we could get a same, you know, similar equation for x, the whole thing is just completely analytic is function of x and y. Okay? So, let us imagine that it is that this quantity was del y of something. By del y, I mean an analytic derivative. Del stands for analytic derivative, del bar stands for anti analytic derivative. Okay? In this case, del y bar times del y would just be del square up to now. So then this would become the equation that del square of this thing was delta. So that thing would have to be a log, which would mean that the thing that we were interested in would be 1 of 1 over z minus z x yeah. Let me call this x and x prime. So clearly what we get is that psi of x psi of x prime is equal to 1 over z minus z prime with some and we have to determine that number. Okay? I'm going to determine the number using this long business. There are many ways to do it with this long business. Okay? So, let's see. First thing we have to do is to look at the relationship between del z, del z bar and del square. Uh, okay. These factors of two are paid to Okay. So z was equal to x plus iy. Okay. Uh, z bar is equal to x minus iy. So what's del z? Del z is equal to del x by del z times del x plus del y by del z times del y. But x was z plus z bar by 2. And this thing comes with an i, but again by 2. Uh, y was z plus z bar by i. So this, I believe, is equal to half into del x minus i del y. Okay, whereas del z bar is equal to half into del x plus i del y. Okay, so that del z, del z bar is equal to one fourth x squared. Are we happy? Okay. Okay. So okay. So so let's see. So, we know that this thing is going to be um, del y bar by pi del y of some alpha times log of y. This has to be equal to minus delta of, uh, of y to set x to 
alpha by pi, we just concluded that this times del squared by 4 log of, we can make this log y by r, because it doesn't matter, log y by r, r is equal to minus delta of y, equal to alpha, so this is alpha by 2 pi del squared log r is equal to minus delta 0, I mean delta, delta 2 r. Okay, so now this is the, this is the th thing we want to solve. So let's see which, what, for what alpha it works. We use Stokes theorem to check that. Okay, we take the first r, uh, first del, this becomes 1 by r times r hat. And then we integrate it over at a 2 pi circle. Okay, so that gives us um, two, 2 pi r by 2 pi. Okay, times alpha. This thing just gives us minus 1, and the alpha is equal to minus 1. Okay, and so we conclude, and then now this is a moment of truth. Does Kuczynski agree with us or not? And so we conclude that psi of z, psi of z prime is equal to minus 1 by z prime minus z. Because that was our y, we said x equals 0. Which is equal to 1 over z prime. Hello? Ha! ha. Oh, almost, next time. Okay. Oh, 
plus minus psi of z by z square plus del z psi. This is at z, but that's zero. It is minus sin square. What? It's minus plus psi. This and del z is that means plus. Which became plus? This one? Huh? Yeah, this thing. Plus del z psi uh, by psi of z by 2z plus regular. Now this is almost the form of the real sort of algebra acting on a primary field. Except that there's a half here. Video sort of algebra acting on a primary field always gives derivatives without the half. Can somebody tell me what the issue is? It's a false question. False paradox, just to see whether I've read the book. Do you understand my paradox? Yeah, because you didn't expand psi on the right. Excellent. This has 1 by z square, but we're supposed to express this in terms of the field evaluated at that at the remaining point. So we're supposed to tailor expand this. So this is psi of 0 plus z del z psi. So that gives me another del z psi by 2, which makes this psi of 0 by z square plus del z by del psi by z. Now uh, this had half. Okay. Okay. So this is exactly the form of the of a Vera sort of uh, of a stress tensor acting on a primary field psi, uh, provided we identify the weight of psi to be half. We knew the weight of psi was half. Okay, we knew that under the branch because we got psi psi del bar. So two times the weight of psi was uh, eaten up by one derivative. You see, there's d2x. Okay, so you have to get totally weight minus two. There's, uh, sorry, totally weight two in the Lagrangian. One derivative has, has weight one. So you need two more. So that means psi had to have weight half. Okay. So we knew that psi had weight, uh, had weight half. Okay. We know, know this in many different ways. But it's satisfying to see this come out of this nice, this nice stress. Okay, I'll leave an exercise to you, for you to uh, check the following. Okay, I'll just do the leading term and the leading term as an exercise to you. So I take minus psi del psi at z by 2 times minus psi del psi at w by 2. Okay? So now I'm taking the TTOP. Let's call this TTOP. I'm doing the TTOP. Okay? I'm going to compute the most singular term. I'm going to compute the most singular term to get the central charge. And then I'll leave for completing the rest of the OP as an exercise. Okay. So, what are the possibilities? Most singular term comes with both of these contracting both of these. So there are two ways to do the contraction. Either we can have this contracting this and this and this, that's nice if there's no sign. That's 1 by 4, if this contracts this, then that contracts that. This contracting this gives us a del of 1 by z. And this contracting this, remember the del was here, so it's minus del. So, gives us a minus of del of 1 by z. Okay, and so this thing was is equal to uh, minus one by uh, four z square. Is that to the power form? Okay. That was the term that this guy contracted this, and this guy contracted this. And the point was that one of the dells gave us plus sign, sign the other del gave us a minus sign. Okay. But now what about the other term? The other term is this guy contracting this guy. So firstly, because we have to take this 
So this contracting this. So we take this through there. So that picks up a minus sign. So there's no overall minus. Then we get psi with psi. So that's a 1 by z. And then we get del z. But then the other derivative is, is the del of minus z. So we have the sign here. Del z squared of 1 by z. And then there was the 1 fourth. Okay, my z's and 2's sometimes look a bit isomorphic. <laughs> okay, now this gives us minus z squared, minus, and then again a minus 2z cubed. Two minus signs cancel. So we get 2 by 4, 1 by z to the 4. Okay, so we put them together. So we get final answer 1 by 4 z to the 4. But we're supposed to write the answer c by 2 by z to the 4. So I identify c is equal to Is this clear? Is this clear, John? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to leave as an exercise for you, a slightly painful exercise, I admit. Uh, to complete this OP calculation, see that you get the 2tz plus del t by. The two T's that, that, that's good. I'm going to. I, how about next class? I'll at random pick someone to do this exercise. Okay, just to make sure that people do the exercises. But this appears at some special value of lambda for the BC. It's like, we've done this exercise before. So half. I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. So this is a particular case of that. Okay. It's a particular case of that. So it's nothing new. Just to uh, tune us. Okay, now actually I have to go because I have to catch a flight and I just got a call from my wife saying there is a terrible traffic jam in the road. Okay, so uh, I think I was going to plan to. Let me just tell you the statement and then we we'll, we'll talk about it next class. Um, the special thing about this theory with both the x's and the sides is that, okay, so now we've got the stress tensor for the size, t for the size, we've got t for the x's. So we've got a full Virasoro algebra with C is equal to 3 by 2. There's two decoupled Virasoro algebras, the central chapter is just added. Okay? But in addition to this Virasoro algebra, we also have a new something. That is, there's this, there's this thing that you can define, which is Tf is equal to Okay, this object here is clearly a primary operation. Why is it clearly a primary operation? Because in under the full mirror sort of full stress tensor, this is primary for the fermions, we just checked that. This is primary for the bosons. There's no singular OP between the bosonic part of T and psi, there's no singular OP between the fermionic part of T and LX. So the whole OP of this is just the sum of the weights, okay, of what we would get for it. So this is some primary operator of dimension what? Del x of dimension? 1. Psi of dimension? Half. Ah. This is a primary operator of weight 3, three half. So T, where T is T for the boson plus T for the boson. Tf has OP uh, 3 by 2 Tf by z squared plus L T F by 2. Okay? So, okay, go with some primary operator. What's really interesting about this? We already know, of course, that T P has OP C by 2 by C3 as uh, 3 halves 
uh, z to the 4 plus 2t as x squared plus delta t. We know this. Okay, that's the old hat now. Okay. What's really interesting is that the third possible commutation prediction process, that is pf, pf, uh, turns out to be um, 1 by z cube plus 2 by z. Always plus not. Okay? What this means is that the full set of commutation and anti commutation relations of modes built out of T and TF closes in L2. Because we've seen that all commutators of modes can be built out of singular parts of O fields. So the point is that this T P is only made up of the bosonic is basically the statement that anti-commutators of various moments of this TF are vera vectors. So now we see that there is a larger algebra in the system. This part tells us that commutators of vera generators are vera generators. This part tells us that commutators of vera generators and moments of TF are appropriate moments of TF. But this part tells us in addition and this is totally new. The anti commutators of the moments of TF are vera Okay? So this system here has a larger symmetry algebra than the conformal algebra. And the symmetry algebra involves anti commutators, not just commutators. And therefore, it's a super algebra. The super algebra is going to play a very important role in everything that follows. We will discuss in detail. Okay, listen people, sorry, next week I'm away. Okay, so our next class will